Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back. Hope you had a nice weekend. It's good to see all of you. We are discussing pluralism and liberalism. This is our last unit in this class. And it's been such a great class. We've learned so much and discussed so many different institutions. The last few weeks, we've focused a great deal on institutions that um, relate more to civil society and citizenship and participation in politics at a popular level. So we've moved away from our earlier emphasis on executive legislative relations and electoral systems. And we've been focusing instead on things like participatory democracy. We've talked about interest groups now. We've covered a variety of issues that get us further away from elites and closer to masses. And this week is no different. Again, we're covering a, a topic that is sort of elusive and amorphous. When we talk about pluralism, it's not like we can point to it. It's not something that has uh, an outline. It's not like a building per se, like a Congress or the presidential palace. Instead, it has more to do with the organization of interests in society in the ways that citizens and groups of citizens are incorporated or not in politics and the different institutions that are involved in that. Pluralism then is a big, bag and it's an umbrella that seems to encompass a great deal and for us it can be hard to put our finger on it but the reading for this week by Leipart did a good job of distinguishing between pluralism and corporatism which is the form of interest group relations that's common in Europe. Now here in the United States we're less familiar with some of the forms that are common in Europe but our focus this week will be discussing these different examples and these different forms and differentiating them and trying to understand their implications for democracy. So as always, we'll be thinking about the big picture, but we'll be focusing also on some of the distinctive characteristics of the different examples. So this is a photo from the Texas State House, and it's an example of interest group relations in the United States. Now, what you're seeing is a number of different groups protesting a sanctuary city bill. The Texas legislature was reviewing and considering a bill against allowing sanctuary cities or cities to designate themselves as sanctuary cities. And if I'm not mistaken, these groups were protesting that bill and protesting this consideration and a variety of different groups assembled on this particular day. But it's a good example of pluralism. And it talks a little bit about the nature of interest group relations here in the United States. But what does this have to do with interest groups? And what does this have to do with pluralism more generally? A picture like this on a day like this in the Texas State House. What does this have to do with pluralism and interest groups? Efren? Um, how we connect to pluralism and interest groups is that these individuals um, can come from a variety of interest groups um, seeking to actually unify behind a single message of like, as you said, a sanctuary city. 
So that's my take on that. Okay. Jeffrey? Well, if I if I understand correctly, pluralism, you know, uh, you know, it's a political theory that non-governmental groups, you know, can influence government, you know, get the government's agenda. So I guess you, you know these interest groups and other non-governmental groups as well are influencing the government to try to pass a bill, you know, that will influence, you know, the, the politics in the state of Texas. But Jeffrey, does pluralism? Does it create any mechanisms, any formal mechanisms for interest group influence or not? Can you uh, repeat that again? But like, because it, it, it's not it's not you. It's just that the question is kind of like kind of confusing me. So I was wondering if you can kind of like frame it like in a different kind yeah, of way. Yeah, so you or... said that you said that pluralism is a system for interest group influence on policy. And my question is, does pluralism involve any formal institutions set up for interest group influence on policy or? Oh, no, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. Okay. Does anyone want to elaborate on that? What is pluralism about if it's not a system that creates formal institutions for interest group participation? What's the nature of pluralism? So Jeffrey points out that pluralism does not create formal mechanisms for interest group participation in policymaking. Now that stands in contrast to corporatist interest group systems where the state creates a place at the decision-making table for key interest groups and it creates essentially an institutional framework for co-equal participation of interest groups at a very high level of concentration. They often are peak associations or peak level organizations that condense and form confederations of a wide stretch of different groups. In a pluralist system, it's very, very different. There are no formal mechanisms for interest group participation. It's the wild, wild west as far as interest groups are concerned. They can participate in politics, but they can do so only like this, where they participate informally and they try to influence decision making through channels that exist, but that don't provide them a formal role in the process. So there are no institutions or there are no mechanisms for interest group participation in a pluralist system. As Jeffrey said, it is a system for interest group influence, but there really are no formal mechanisms for such influence. Now that's your first important clue because remember that we're evaluating these different interest group systems based on how democratic they are we're trying to think about their different implications for democracy. So what you're looking at here, you're looking at groups who've organized and come together, but not necessarily under some formal mechanism or some formal process. They're just petitioning the Texas legislature to hear them out. So this is our first clue. Now, Let's start at a very general level, step back. The interest group system is really the last difference between majoritarian and consensus democracy. Remember that at the outset of this semester, one of the ways that we distinguished between democracies was by referring to majoritarian democracies and consensus democracies. Now those majoritarian systems often have single member district electoral systems, presidential systems. They often have 
majoritarian electoral institutions. They have party systems that are smaller, where power is more concentrated in the hands of a few parties. Corporatist systems, or excuse me, consensus democracies on the other hand, they often have proportional representation electoral systems, parliamentary legislatures, they often have multi-party systems. And in general, they're set up to be more consensual. Leipart tells us that these institutional differences add up to a sizable distinction between majoritarian democracy and consensus democracy. Now there's one more distinction that becomes important when we distinguish between these types of democracy. And that is the distinction between the pluralist and the corporatist types of interest group systems that we've already begun to elaborate. Now, before we continue, let's get some more student input. What kind of interest group system does the United States have? Let's raise our hands. Jake. Um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly uh, like what the definite answer is, but um, I think it's somewhere in between because like corporations in the United States don't have necessarily like a formal seat um, in the lawmaking process, but the the like wills of the corporation or like the, the voice of the corporations are definitely heard through whatever representatives or you know whatever elected politicians that they like donate to so like big corporations that are able to make big um campaign donations to certain politicians are gonna have somewhat of a seat at the table but not like a formal seat like in other um like more strictly corporatist systems okay can we hear from someone else what kind of interest group system does the United States have? There's a distinction between the pluralist and the corporatist type. These are the two types that we've so far distinguished and that we'll use to understand different interest group systems. So does the United States have a pluralist or a corporatist system? Jeffrey says we have grassroots interest groups. Does that suggest, or does that seem more in line with the pluralist or the corporatist type? So Tayana and Jake both point out pluralist. Jeffrey says both. We have pluralist interest group relations. And it's, it's because we don't have these large peak confederal associations that are state sanctioned and that are brought into a formal decision-making process. We have plenty of interest groups, but they're all very fragmented and decentralized. They're, quite large in some cases, but they all have a very narrow particular interest. And they're most importantly not brought into any formal relationship or bargaining or interest group system process. They're very, very atomized and kind of deinstitutionalized in this respect. They don't have a formal role. They do exist though, and they do have a legal personality and they lobby Congress and they try to influence legislators and they try to get policies that are favorable to them. And so they do participate. As Jake points out, corporation, cor corporations, corporations, corporations in particular seem to have strong alliances with the Republican Party. But it's important to note that having the support of the Republican Party doesn't mean that we have a corporatist system. 
the business sector will oftentimes have supporters in political parties. That's a normal part of pol politics. For us to have a corporatist system, we would have to have a formal, a set of formal institutions that create a place at the decision-making table for these actors and these interest groups. We don't have that. Instead, we have something much more sort of inchoate and atomized where we have all these different interest groups that are just kind of free floating and just kind of out there competing for influence and trying to get the ear of whatever legislator or committee will hear them. So we do have a pluralist system and it's, it's very evident when you consider, for example, that we have interest groups that exist across the spectrum in that that represent virtually every conceivable interest imaginable. And that pluralism is, is also inherent in labor relations where unions and employers are relatively decentralized in their organization. We don't have these large peak confederal organizations that unite workers under a single union. We don't have peak associations of employers where firms and employers are organized under a single confederation of employers. Instead, we have these very loose um, situations where in many cases unions don't even exist, let alone exist in some sort of formal framework for decision making. So let's take this apart and discuss this piece by piece. A pluralist system is a competitive and uncoordinated pluralism of different groups. This is a, a free for all. It's like a market of interest groups. We don't have institutions or arrangements set up to bring them into a formal relationship with each other or with the government. Instead, they just kind of exist in the ether and they just kind of float. The United States, the United Kingdom, Greece, and Canada all have this model, um, as do many other countries. But European countries, as I'll show you in a minute, don't typically have this model. This is much more common in, in North America, this Australia. But when we have a pluralist form of interest group relations, it's possible to get a lot of different outcomes in a lot of different political relationships between individual interest groups and, in, say, legislators or political parties. And so Jake mentioned, for example, that business have business groups in the United States have the support of, of both political parties. For instance, Wall Street firms and banks have a lot of support within the Democratic Party. They also clearly would have the, the sympathy of the Republican Party because this is um, a, an important business group that is well organized and has a, a very powerful presence in Washington. Business groups are well organized in the United States and in Canada. And these interest groups, in particular, say groups like the defense industry, which is a private sector, these groups are often very, very well organized and they provide electoral support to parties or legislators in Congress who might respond with friendly legislation and oversight. Congress itself is in a relationship with the public bureaucracy that is also involved in a relationship with the firms and society or in the economy through regulation and the decisions that the bureaucracy makes regarding specific policy implementation. There's a very, very incestuous kind of relationship often with particular business groups, legislators in the bureaucracy. When we have a pluralist scenario or a pluralist environment that's marked by an absence of institutions, these sorts of relationships can develop where interest groups provide support to legislators, Congress funds bureaucracies who also develop relationships with Congress and who regulate interest groups. And in turn, you get this kind of revolving door of favorable policies and decisions that creates a set of informal practices and informal relationships, but those relationships are themselves not formal. They are not in any way legal uh, in the sense that they're not institutionalized in a formal set of mechanisms. This is all taking place essentially de facto. It's all essentially informal because the system is pluralist by its very nature. It's not uh, corporatist. It's, it's not institutionalized in the sense that I'll 
explain in a moment where we'll discuss the European examples. Before we continue, does anyone have any questions or comments about this setup or this kind of interest group relations? Jeffrey. Uh, not in the sense of how it functions, but are we going to talk about the cons later of, of interest groups and you know how the pluralist system may function or no? What are the cons? Oh, you know, for example, um, free writing, for example, how, you know, sometimes people want to gain the benefits without putting in the work with the rest of, you know, the interest groups. Yeah, so the collective action problem, um, that's a problem that relates to political parties as well as interest groups. And it relates to really most problems that we address in politics. So we won't address the collective action problem. That's a little further away from, from what we'll deal with in this class. For us, we're dealing with the different types of interest group systems. So the collective action problem exists in both pluralist and in corporatist systems. And the collective action problem is, is one potential obstacle to forming effective groups, but it's, it's so uh, fundamental to, to a lot of this that, that it, would, um, it would be a, a class or a unit that we could do on its own. So we won't be addressing the collective action problem, um, but it is certainly a, a part of the issue. And we think about groups and political parties and interest groups and how they overcome the collective action problem helps us to explain their success or their failure. And so groups that can punish free riding and groups that can distribute benefits widely within the group and groups that can effectively manage organization costs, those groups are the woes that those, those groups that are more effective. And those groups presumably exist in both pluralist as well as corporatist systems. And so so for us, the most important distinction is between pluralist and corporatist. So the corporatist system is really where we begin to see the difference between the US experience that we're familiar with and the experience of most of Europe, where interest groups of great significance are brought together in peak organizations and they are given a formal legal personality as a coherent association and they are brought into the, pro the process of policy formation. They're given a seat at the table, the decision-making table. And this is sort of, it's called concerted bargaining where it takes place in, in Europe. And the idea is that instead of just leaving interest groups to their whims, and having them organize themselves freely without guidance or institutions or any set of formal responsibilities or roles, set up a system where there are channels for their participation and where they are organized coherently so that they can work effectively and cooperate with government in a sort of concerted, tripartite, cooperative, consensual way. Now, this is very different than what we're familiar with here in the United States, where, where our interest group relations are competitive and, and not solidaristic and not cooperative. By their very nature, they are competitive. Relationships between business and, and unions are very competitive. Relationships between government and business can be competitive. And in general, it's often viewed very differently, the problem of of industrial relations. In fact, in the United States, the most often uh, response of firms is to try to cripple unions before they can form. Whereas in Europe, European countries, the corporate system rewards the organization of workers and employers in very large, uh, coherent, top-down organizations. These corporate systems are focused on consensus and in generating decision making through a process of collaboration. At the very middle of the different possible systems or the different possible forms that this can take is what we call the tripartite social partnership between the government, labor, and 
employers. And this is where that takes place. This is a form of cooperation where they set wages collaboratively. They engage in a form of very centralized collective bargaining and they set wages and wage levels and benefits for everyone in the sector or everyone in the economy, depending upon the level of organization of the unions and the employers. And the government is involved as well in this process of concertation. And this takes place in Northern and Western Europe. Throughout Western and Northern Europe, it's especially common in Scandinavia where the highest levels of organization are found in places like Norway and in, in the past in Sweden, where they had very centralized, very, very centralized bargaining and very centralized interest group relations. But you can imagine a variety of different forms depending upon the different forms or levels of business, government or labor involvement. It's true that in theory, a corporatist system is most corporatist when government, business, and employers are all involved. But you could also imagine a scenario where it's just government and business, or it's just labor and government, or it's just business and labor. All of these different scenarios have been observed in different examples or different time periods. But the key point is that a corporatist system is characterized by formal mechanisms of incorporation into the decision-making process for labor, for employers, for government. Now, what this doesn't include, obviously, is interest group relations around social issues and things that don't relate directly to the social wage or the benefits that individuals get through work or from the government. But these corporatist systems do as successfully incorporate most social and economic and political issues into their decision making. And so the system is, is fundamentally different than say what we are familiar with here. Before we continue, does anyone have any comments or questions about this slide? So when we talk about corporatism, the key idea is that it is a system of interest group relations that brings peak organizations into formal decision-making. Now those organizations are labor, employers, and government. But corporatism is also distinguished by essentially concert, concerted bargaining or, or concerted bargaining at each level of social organization. So it's not just in the interest group system at a high level where government, labor, and employers are bargaining and negotiating. They're also doing it within the company itself at the shop floor level within each individual firm. If you have a job or if you've ever worked in the United States, you've mainly, you've probably noticed that workers don't have a lot of influence at the firm level. It's not like you meet with the company management and decide together on a co-equal basis what to do with the company. If you've had that experience at work, I'd love to hear about it. Some companies are like that in the US, but it's the exception, it's not the norm. This is a reflection of our pluralist form of organization where our interest group relations involve very free floating, sort of unorganized, uninstitutionalized relationships that take place really in the private sector. So if you are part of a union, that union is not brought into a formal bargaining relationship by the government. It's, it's engaging in that bargaining relationship essentially in the private interest group sphere. Now, in a corporatist system, though, that bargaining and those negotiations and that decision making is taking place within institutional channels, and it takes place within the company as well. And co-determination 
is that institutional arrangement that takes place within the company. This is where workers and company management come together as part of a formal process within the company. And they make decisions about restructuring, production, the future of the firm, everything, everything that affects the workers, they're a part of that decision-making. And this is a reflection of corporatist interest group relations at the firm level. So whereas a pluralist interest group system at the firm level is characterized by very unorganized and essentially private relations between labor and capital, in a corporatist system, there is a re relatively organized and sort of official and institutionalized public relationship between workers and capital within the firm. Very, very different. So let's watch this video, which is admittedly a little bit, um, well, it's, it's uh, animated, but it's actually hard to get footage of co-determination because it's effectively a, a, a within the boardroom process, right? So it's hard to illustrate it, but let's learn what we can from this and then we'll return in a moment. Hello, Fiona. Can I explain any industrial relations concepts? Professor Siegfried, what is co-determination? Well, Fiona, co-determination is a structure of decision-making within the enterprise whereby employees and their representatives exert influence on decisions, often at a senior level and at a relatively early stage of formulation. Co-determination may operate in parallel to and complement other industrial relations mechanisms of employee representation and influence. It does not substitute for other mechanisms of employee influence on management decision making, such as collective bargaining. Professor, can you give some examples of co-determination? Well, co-determination is rooted in the industrial relations traditions of a number of EU member states. For example, in Germany, there are two distinct levels of co-determination at establishment level via the Works Council and at enterprise level on the supervisory board of companies. In Austria, Works Councils have the right to negotiate a social plan in the event of decisions involving restructuring, which may lead to job losses. In Denmark, employees have the right to elect a third of members of the company board and through this mechanism they exercise a powerful voice in votes on matters that can have a major impact on the workforce. In summary, co-determination is an excellent technique for collaborative decision making in an enterprise and results in higher quality decision making. I have included a useful link for more information on this subject. Thanks Professor for explaining co-determination in the workplace. So sort of a funny video, but it's actually useful because co-determination is multi-level and countries have distinct co-determination policies. They always reflect their historical and institutional conditions. And Austria then is different than Denmark, which is different than Sweden and Norway and so on. But always and everywhere where it exists, it is a reflection of corporatism and the, the formal creation of mechanisms for collaborative decision making between interest groups. Very different than what we have in the United States. In fact, it's so different that for us here, we're much more familiar with union busting and efforts by large corporations to, to prevent the formation of unions. And I think that a useful way for us to, to think about the situation in the United States and how pluralist interest group relations manifest at the firm level is to just look at the case of Amazon, where the effort to unionize the company has been underway for some time, but where the, the company, like other U.S. firms, has, has been entirely resistant. It has crippled the effort at every step of the way. And these contrasts couldn't be starker. In fact, in Germany, when economic policy changes became a, a frequent occurrence in the 90s and 2000s, many people all over the world expected the, the country to demolish their institutions 
for worker representation. But the big companies in the management and the capital owners said that they would never do that because the advantage of the model was worker representation and that the interest group system worked effectively to contribute to the performance and the success of the German economy. And so not only did German management and firms resist labor deregulation and reform, they promoted and deepened the corporatist interest group system that was in place there in response to the deepening of globalization. So let's watch this video. And I just want you to focus on the, the nature of the interest group relations and the, the way that the pluralist system leaves workers in this situation really without recourse and without the ability to form and take advantage of those mechanisms for, for worker representation that otherwise exist in, in many other places. My name is Dale Richardson. I work for Amazon, I'm a kicker, and I've been at Amazon 10 months. What did you think that job would be like when you first got it? Well, like any here about it, Amazon, you know, nice place to work for, new company, right? They bring an investment, you know, thought it was gonna be great. But I worked there a couple, couple months. I realized it needed to be some changes. I just felt like they weren't communicating. They was fine employees for no reason. Daryl Richardson works at the Amazon Fulfillment Center in Bessemer, Alabama. It's a 10 hour shift. His job is to help fill orders by sorting hundreds of items an hour. They were changing our schedule while we were asleep. So for me to stay, I felt like something had to change. To be honest, I, I, was, I was ready to quit. And I felt like somebody got to do something. So, so what did you do? I made a phone call and I left out to, to the guys to see, can we get some help? So you're the one who started all of this? <laughs> I made the phone call. But it's a collective effort, right? Right. Amazon workers have tried to unionize before, but only in Alabama have organizers made it this far, in spite of it being a generally anti-union state. Since Daryl made the phone call to a national retail workers union, organizers have been stationed outside this facility. Workers have until the end of March to vote yes or no on whether to let the union represent them. They're not up against a normal company. While many businesses closed last year, Amazon's sales went up by $100 billion. If workers succeed at forming a union here, it could happen anywhere. I'm up here with you up. That's what's up. <laughs> you, 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 you and other 6,000 workers here. Up, what's up, baby? What's up? I know what the union can do. I know what the union can bring to a company. Only thing I want is everybody get treated fair. Everybody get paid for what they deserve. We want the next generation to the next generation. If they got to work for Amazon, they don't have to go through the things we're going through. Amazon said in a statement that it already offers what unions are requesting. Base pay, that's double the minimum wage, and competitive benefits. Amazon also says it doesn't think the majority of workers agree with the union. But some here in Alabama say they've been convinced to organize by the day-to-day -day conditions. I would like for them to change the breaks. We have long hours and we have uh, high capacity jobs to do. I think two breaks a day is not enough for a 10 hour shift at Amazon. Constant anxiety. I'm constantly, uh, I'm, when I clock into work, that starts, I'm clocking into being worried about being fired. Constant anxiety. And you shouldn't feel that way you shouldn't feel that way when you're going to work. The time off task is um, a detriment. I think it's a productivity thing. They want you to crank out as many things as possible, but they start counting your time off task after like 10 minutes. And if, if there's only two bathrooms on a floor, that's enormous. I'm at 15 minutes by the time I get back to my station. Could you be disciplined for that? Yeah, you could be written up for time off task. What does that tell you about Amazon's values? Their values is not about the employees. They just want to keep the company, uh, they want to keep power and control. Hyper-individualistic environment. That's why you see all of these, the blurbs from the people who work there. I don't want to eat. I like it the way it is. Amazon disputed that workers' hours were changed while they were sleeping. And it argued that it gives adequate time for bathroom breaks. 
Who's this? <laughs> this is Pepita. <laughs> hey girl. I just got this, right? So I just got put in a new role. So I kind of feel like a badass with my new harness on. Is it fun to work at Amazon sometimes? Yeah, sometimes it definitely is fun, especially when they want to teach you some something new. Like this, I just started doing this this past week. And yeah, it was really exciting because it feels like they're noticing you. They're noticing that hard work that you do. But then, you know, once you start doing it, then it's back to the metrics and the time off task. And so nothing really changes. The first thing that they did was they started hanging up this, the propaganda. The uh, boat, no. Amazon set up anti-union placards in the break room, the warehouse, and even inside bathroom stalls. And then they sent people down from other places. And they're all over the place, and they have them for every shift. And what they would do is they would come around and go to each station and ask you, hey, I'm Joe Blow from wherever. Do you have any questions about the union? I'm here to answer your questions. The next thing was the classes. They had somebody who was like their the captain of the union busting who would come down and teach like what was the official title of the class they just called it like union training that's it which is funny because it's not union training it's anti it's union busting 101 jc thompson didn't need convincing he already thought that a union was not necessary thompson works the overnight shift four days a week overseeing up to 60 employees on sunday mornings you'll find him at his church to everyone, to everyone. What's your opinion on the unionization drive that's going on at your Amazon facility? Some people will take this and say, I'm anti-union. I'm not anti-union. I believe that there is a place for unions in certain situations, but I just don't feel at Amazon at this moment that there is a place because Everything that a union would possibly fight for, we already have. Amazon, you walk in the door, the ground level is $15. I have 401k, I have medical, dental, vision. I get a raise every six months. So I'm, I'm asking myself, like, what else can the union actually offer for real? I tell people when I talk to employees, we only been open a year. And we really hadn't had a chance to build a core team. Everybody, all the operations managers, most of them are from other places. There's a culture that Amazon has, and then there's a culture that, a, that an associate brings with themselves. So how do you merge those two, two cultures together? And I think that's that has been the problem. And then we have... So you're acknowledging that there are problems? Of course. Amazon hopes it's more than 1 million U.S. workers will see things like JC does. Nonetheless, the drive is gaining momentum. I strongly support your efforts to form a union. And there should be no intimidation, no coercion, no threats, no anti-union propaganda. We need you to be, well, yes, you carry on the spirit and tradition in Alabama that has fought against so many obstacles. If the vote is successful and other workplaces in the area are inspired by what happened at Amazon locally, do you think that's a good thing? I think it can be a good thing because I, I, there are other places that I think that have non-union that actually need a union, that they don't have what we have. Now, you know, down the road, we get past this hump and we see how the leadership learns from this experience. If the vote is no, um, then we will see. Um, and there's always, even if it doesn't, uh, if, even if the vote is not yes, there's always an opportunity to bring it up again. So just because it didn't get voted in now doesn't mean it's, it's never. We have had multiple fights with, with employees today. So security is kind of hiding today. And it's because of what we're going through here with the union talks. So it's going to be a difficult, it's going to be a difficult day, I can tell you. So we'll see. I'm telling you right now, I don't need a union. Why not? Because I haven't had any problems yet. That's what I'm getting at. These people, because they haven't, well, I do everything I'm supposed to do and nothing about my life is complicated, so I don't need it. God forbid that you do need it, but you were too much of a coward and you were selfish that you didn't want other people to have help and have somebody to speak for them. 
So now we don't have it and you're just like the rest of us. All right, everybody. So the reason I showed you this is because I wanted to give you a sense of how different the models are. Like the contrast could not be sharper. On the one hand, in places like Germany, employers, capital owners, managers fight to preserve unions. On the other hand, in places like the United States, those same people fight to prevent unions. And so I've written out a question in the chat that I've sent to everyone. And the question is, how would the outcome of this unionization effort be different if the United States had a corporatist interest group system instead of a pluralist system? So can anyone answer that question for us? Jake? Um, would it be like if the union was formed, then um, that union could possibly have like a seat at the legislative table? So like having like a voice in the in the law making process that so they can advocate for, you know, like better workers um, conditions or is, would it totally like, would it be something like that? Totally. Yeah. If we had a corporatist system, well, Amazon would be brought into a formal bargaining relationship with its workers. And those workers would be represented in a peak association or peak labor association. And they wouldn't be fighting to unionize. They would already be unionized. Or at the very least, it would be a very easy process. Efren says unions could potentially reform the work environment because they would advocate on legislations that benefit workers, without a doubt, right? Efren, because they then have a seat at the table and they would have leverage, the, the potential power to change working conditions or improve working conditions. The key point is that this entire situation exists in the first place because we have a pluralist interest group environment. That woman in the video put it so perfectly when she said, it's a hyper individualistic environment. That is the essence of a pluralistic environment. Individual over collective. Individuals are the key unit of analysis, not groups. That is the essence of a pluralistic system. The individual over the group. Jeffrey says, I actually work for a union. Now that's interesting. What union do you work for, Jeffrey? I'm looking it up right now. Uh, let's see, it's just really quick. It is called the, um, the UFCW uh, 324. Basically, uh, if you, if you know the, the supermarket called El Super, basically El Super and many other grocery stores, they usually, uh, they're usually part of unions. So in order for me to actually work for this marketplace, I have to basically uh, register to be part of that union that, that the market works for and that's a part of. I mean, you gain a lot of benefits even though that money gets taken out of my check to basically go towards uh, my membership. It's still pretty cool because I'm still protected from like, for example, like bosses can fire people for silly reasons or for un, or unjust reasons. Like they actually have to, has to go straight to the union. And then sometimes the union would actually get involved to see what actually went on. But I mean, it's pretty cool. Totally. Yeah, those are good protections. And unions are the real deal because they have power that individuals don't have and they can act on behalf of 
the interests of a large group of individuals and they can use the collective power and the leverage that you have as a group. And that's what makes the difference. And Jeffrey's experience is notable because that's an experience that many of us don't have, right? Living in a pluralistic interest group system, we are often individuals in a sea of individuals fighting against corporations or managers or you know, better organized elite interests who themselves are also relatively narrowly organized, but who often have much more power than we do because they have deeper pockets. Um, so Kimberly says, my previous job wanted to unionize. Interesting, Kimberly, uh, do you mind mentioning what, uh, what that job was or what that company was? Yeah, I worked at a nursing home um, here in the town that I live in. And this actually went on for a while and they wanted to like to unionize, but I think it ended up not happening. Yeah, but there was like a lot of problems in that company that I worked for. So, yeah, mm -hmm. good. Thank you for sharing. And, you know, the key point is if, if, if we were living in Norway or Denmark or Germany, we would already be represented by a union and our, our wages would be subject to bargaining. They would take place collectively. And our union leaders would sit at the table with government leaders and leaders of the companies that we work for, and they would be, they would be involved collaboratively in decision-making. And so our experience would be very, very different. These fights over whether or not unions could form in the first place wouldn't take place because the unions would already exist. And the, the system would depend on the continuation of the union's role at, in decision-making. So this is just the beginning. On Wednesday and Friday, we'll continue to explore this and we'll get into much more detail. But this is a, a, a start and we will look at the issue from different angles starting on Wednesday. But thank you everybody for being here and I'll see you on Wednesday. Thanks everybody, have a great day. Bye professor. See you Max. Oh, hi, Professor. Um, how are you doing? <laughs> um, I just